All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Emily Calkins and I'm a librarian with the King County Library System. Thank you so much for joining us today for this conversation about Heartberries. Before we get started, I just have a little housekeeping to do. Um, so there are a couple of ways to participate in today's uh, webcast. A bunch of you are already chatting away in the chat, so that's great. Um, after the conversation, Teresa and Sarah will also have some time for audience questions. So down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little ask a question button. That's where, you're, that's where we'll be taking questions from. So go ahead and submit your questions there. And you can also vote for other people's questions. So if you see a really good one that you'd like to have them answer, um, go ahead and vote for it. We are very grateful to the KCLS Foundation for their support of tonight's event and our ongoing author series. If you'd like to help support these events, you can do that by clicking the donate button below. Uh, so that is where you can do that. Um, to learn more about our upcoming author events, you can visit kcls.org slash author voices, and I'll put that link in the chat as well. We have lots of great stuff coming up. Um, if you'd like to purchase a copy of Heartberries, the link below will take you to Third Place Books, our partner bookstore, and they have um, the books for sale. They also have put a link in the chat. And that's it for housekeeping. Uh, we are, the King County Library System is delighted to present Therese Marie uh, Myatt in, in conversation with Sarah Ortiz. Therese Marie Myatt is from Seabird Island Band. Her work has appeared in Guernica, in Elle, in Mother Jones, Medium, Al Jazeera, The Los Angeles Times, and Best American Essays. She's the New York Times bestselling author of Heartberries. Her book was a finalist for the Governor General's Literary Award. It was selected by Emma Watson as a, our shared shelf book club pick. It was also the January 2020 book club pick for um, Now Read This, which is the New York Times and PBS NewsHour book club. It was chosen as a best book of the year by NPR, by Library Journal, the New York Public Library, the Chicago Public Library, um, and Harper's Bazaar. And it was on our best books of the year list at the King County Library System as well. Uh, she is the recipient of the 2019 Whitting Award, and she's also a recipient of the Spalding Prize for the Promotion of Peace and Justice in Literature. She teaches creative writing at Purdue University. And Sarah Marie Ortiz is Pueblo of Acoma. Uh, she's a graduate of the Institute of American Indian Arts and Antioch, University's Los, Antioch University Los Angeles's Masters of Fine Arts program with a concentration in creative nonfiction. She's formally studied law, indigenous education, global self-determination in indigenous communities, journalism, radio, theater, critical theory, and film. Ms. Ortiz has worked in native arts, in education, and in culture advocacy for over 16 years, from her first days as a student at the Institute of American Indian Arts to today. She's published widely and has been featured in the Kenyon Review, in Plowshares, the Florida Review, the American Indian Graduate, and Indian Country Today Media Network. She's presented at tribal schools and colleges, at conferences, universities, cultural centers, and community hubs from New Mexico to Johannesburg, South Africa. Sarah lives in Burien, Washington, so she's local to us here in the King County Library System. She's the Urban West Representative for the Washington State Native American Education Advisory Committee. She's the lead coordinator for the Northwest Native Writer Circle, and she's currently the Native Student Success Program Manager for the Highland Public Schools. So in short, we have two very incredible, interesting, and accomplished women with us tonight, and I'm very glad that they're both here. So thank you to both of you for being with us, and I will turn it over to Therese for reading. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, it's late where I am, so. You know, I'm I'm not even sleepy. I feel good. Um, so thank you for staying up. Thank you for being here today. I'm uh, really happy to share my work. I'm really happy to connect tonight. Um, and I'm hiding in my room uh, away from the kids. So everyone can hear me okay, I hope. Um, and I hope if there's some technical issues, you give me a little grace. Um, you never know, you never know. And I think I'm gonna read from Hardberries. Um, I have the paperback. And I'm also gonna read a piece that I wrote for my dear friend Candace, who um, she passed away from, uh, during the pandemic, she passed away from breast cancer and um, 
she was a wonderful, wonderful woman. And um, I wrote this kind of, I hope you can hear me. I know somebody said speak louder and I'm trying to use my, like my real, my reading voice uh, without a microphone. So uh, this is okay, right? You can hear me. I hope so. I hope so. All right. So this piece is, uh, it's called Wolf Clan Woman. And it's um, currently in the LA Review of Books, I think. It was just published there. And um, all right, let me start. And it's a short essay, which I've never written before, but I guess maybe all my essays are short. And I'm just realizing that now. <clears throat> Wolf Clan Woman. They didn't capitalize your name in the obituary. They didn't say you were Wolf Clan or that you died sober. They didn't say when you called your grandmother to catch up, she put your abuser on the phone. And that's why you don't trust some people. They didn't say your father was a survivor. He was taken from his people, given to the nuns and priests, and then reunited with his mother. It was a time of joy and reclamation. Then lightning struck his house. He was reading comics with his sister. He said the whole house lit up like a million candles. There wasn't a shadow in that house. His leg caught fire. The doctors told him he wouldn't survive. He said, get the fuck out of here. They didn't say you wore Skechers, mom shoes, purposely, for the fun of the mention, for the comfort, to say there was some cuteness and resignation in what we do now as mothers. You wore shirts that said blessed and hype. And you watched reality TV like you knew the people, affected when most would laugh. Grief is oversight and the things we forget to honor, like being your closest loved one and forgetting to capitalize your name. Forgetting text lives forever beyond us. When you were in the middle of chemotherapy, I cleaned your house. I held each wig you owned and examined it from all dimensions. The red one was my favorite. My brother said it made you look too res, but that's exactly why I liked it. I looked at your journals where you listed plans, organized treatments, and wrote down different subsidies you could apply for. I felt honored to see your life as vulnerable as it was. The notes were what compelled me to keep cleaning, to get on my hands and knees and wipe the corners. I wanted you to have one thing. You were a survivor, you know, even if you didn't survive everything. We can only contain so much. They will say, Wolf Clan Woman was so tough, so much gossip, so much criticism and cackle, so much nurturing and home cooked meals, so much fight, so much yellow in the medicine wheel that after our last hug, you placed Yukon sweetgrass in my hand. You were tough medicine and absoluteness, no forgiveness, no second chances, all forwardness and motion. They didn't say, what filters you liked, or that when you went to hospice, the man who threatened to kill you came to abduct his child. They didn't say how you had to pull restraining orders up on your phone from a hospital bed. They didn't say you never had a chance to rest. Nobody wants to talk about the threats on your life. Nobody wants to make myth of you yet. I'd like to think if I wrote your obituary, that I wouldn't let you down, but words fail to execute the sharp edge of young death. And that's, um, 
That's Wolf Clan Woman. Somebody said to adjust my screen. This feels so weird. It's like you guys are directing me. Um, I don't know. This new reading online, I, I almost feel like it's more intimate because you get to be in the comfort of your space, you know. And you also, you don't have to wear pants. And I think that's one of the other things. Um, so I have heart berries. Let's see. I'm going to read. All right, hold on. I'm going to read. I'm going to read part of I Know I'll Go. And uh, here we go. <clears throat> And I'll try to, I have to get close to this microphone. So if my chin cuts off, just pretend you see it. All right. I know I'll go. And uh, this is about my dad, Ken. My father died at the Thunderbird Hotel on Flood Hope Road. According to documents, he was beaten over a sex worker or a cigarette. I prefer the cigarette. I considered an Indian death myself while walking along the country roads of my reserve before I really considered life. His death intruded as I could not fathom being a good person when I came from such misery. I found newspaper clips about my father, Ken, and four men abducted a girl. There aren't any details. There are documents about his murder and the transitional housing program he was in when he died. He was homeless and social welfare gave him a hotel room next to younger, more violent men. There's nothing easy about his memory or what he left behind. He was an anomaly, a drunk savant. He took his brushes, colors and stool when he left my mother, I was, um, it was harvest and the corn stalks were gold and waving. I was waiting outside on the porch and ate blueberries. I spit out anything too ripe, a purple liquid. His hair was black and coarse. He was wearing a baseball t-shirt and jeans covered in rust acrylic. As an Indian woman, I resist the urge to bleed out on a page to impart the story of my drunken father. It was dangerous to be alone with him, as it was dangerous to forgive, as it was dangerous to say he was a monster. If he were a monster, that would make me part monster, part Indian. It's my politic to write the humanity in my characters and subvert the stereotypes. Isn't that my duty as an Indian writer? But what part of him was subversion? Our basement smelled like river water and cedar bough. He carved and painted endlessly in the corners of the room. While I sat in his lap, he taught me our icons. Eagle was mother. Bolts were thunder being, and his circles were the universe. It meant so much to draw a circle well. He practiced and let me watch. I remember when he left, my mother started to paint again. I remember that while my father tried to draw a circle with his own eyes and hands, my mother used coffee cans. I resist the iconography and found, find myself more interested in why Salish work isn't true to life. My therapist asked me to speak to my father and my mother in a session. I told my father, a bird is just a bird. A mother is a tangible thing. Making Indian women inhuman is a problem for me. We've become too symbolic and never real enough. My therapist said 
talking to your mother, and I couldn't. My father was soft looking sometimes. I liked to sleep in the crook of his neck. He smelled like old spice and bergamot. His hands shook when he was not drinking at his worst. And when I held his hands, he seemed thankful. He delighted in my imagination. The grass was always high in our lawn and he often let me use the hose to fill buckets or wash tires and I pretended it was a snake. My mother wanted to heal him. I remember several trips to visit him in rehab. She sent him to islands and I remember wearing a life jacket crossing water to somewhere in Tofino. I remember each hope given to me by my mother that our father would be okay and that things would be different. In the past, I wanted to tell her that some things can't be loved away, but she knew that. We left my father a few times. We stayed in my uncle's home. Mom took all four of us along with my grandmother and we slept in one room. I had chicken pox. I slept in a green upholstered chair and had an accident. My brother Ovi was awake. He told me to undress and took off his shirt for me to wear. I went back to sleep with a sour stomach and woke up as my father was forklifting me from the chair to his van. He always found us. Once I packed my bags, mimicking my mother. With a bag of dolls and wooden cars, I told him I was leaving. I told him I wouldn't come back until he stopped drinking. Come here, he said. No. He promised me he would quit and then he left. My brothers told me that I didn't, that he didn't really leave. I misremembered. My grandmother saved money and asked our cousin to kill him. The man beat him well, and when my father came home, we were gone. He ruined every artwork we possess. He tossed every can of salmon and beets that my grandmother prepared for winter. He took jewelry, he took money. When we got home, everyone told me to wait on the porch. They went inside and cleaned while I stared at my spit. For years, they were happy to let me imagine he left on his own regard. After my mother died, I went to find him. He lived in a town called Hope. He had a new family and our van sat in his front lawn on bricks. When he answered the door, he told me he knew who I was. He had a thin, dirty white shirt on. He looked ill and his face was gone. His hair was still black in some parts. His wife was my older sister's childhood friend. My father had met her when she was a girl visiting my sister. After years with Ken, you could see the hard life she lived. She smiled at me and said my father had old videotapes of theater work I did in the community. I had five new brothers so young. They looked like the archetypes my own family had formed in the presence of my father. I found myself in the youngest child who formed bonds too quickly and needed holding. My father and I sat across from each other in lawn chairs in his basement I resisted the urge to sit like him. Instead, I held bad posture and slunk in my chair. You have my nose, he said. I said I missed him, feeling awful it was true. The best thing I could do was leave. I know, I said. Your mother was a good woman. I told her I was an asshole and she took me in like a wounded bear. I know, I said. A month after this, he showed up at my house with a white documentary filmmaker. I answered the door, but could not let him in the house. My brother, Obi, was still scared and angry and confused. 
They're doing a documentary about me, he said, about my art. I was anxious standing there with him at my door. I know, he said, I'll go. I hugged him in my driveway and I knew the whole res was watching. And I knew I had betrayed my family a little bit. And I'll skip ahead just to the next passage. The National Film Board of Canada debuted the documentary as a piece with immediacy and no external narrative. I'm a woman wielding narrative now, weaving the parts of my father's life with my own. I consider his work a testimony to his being. I have one of his paintings, Man Emerging. The artwork is traditional and simplistic. Salish work calls for simplicity because an animal or man should not be convoluted. My father was not a monster, although it was in his monstrous nature to leave my brother and I alone in his van while he drank at the Kent. Our breath became visible in the cold. Ken came back to bring us fried mushrooms and we took to the bar fare like puppies to slop. His smell was not monstrous, nor the crooks of his body. The invasive thought that he died alone in a hotel is too much. It's dangerous to think about him, as it was dangerous to have him as my father, as it is dangerous to mourn someone I fear becoming. I don't write this to put him to rest, but to resurrect him as a man. When public record portrays him as a drunk, a monster, a transient. I wish I could have known him as a child in his newness. I want to see him with the sheen of perfection, with skin unscathed by his mistakes or his father's. It's in my nature to love him. I can't love who he was, but I can see him as a child. Before my mother died, I asked her if he had ever hurt me. I put you in double diapers, she said. There's no way he hurt you. Did he hurt you? No, I said. If rock is permeable in water, I wonder what that makes me in all of this. There's a picture of my brother, Ovi, and me next to dad's van. My chin is turned up. And at the bottom of my irises, there's a brightness. My brother has his hands on his hip and he looks protective standing over me. I know without remembering clearly that my father took this picture and that we loved each other. I don't think I can forgive myself for my compassion. And that's, um, that's I know I'll go about my dad. Um, I don't know how long I've been reading. Um, I'm wondering if I should read something else or if that's enough of me. I don't know. Sarah, do you have opinions? Where's Sarah? I think that there's still, there's um, probably a few more minutes if you wanted to read another, another piece, Therese, maybe a short sure. one and then we can launch into our convo. All right. I'll read a short thing. Like, um, Let's see, I know what I'll read. It's something that's healing. And it's um, it's from the perspective of a cedar tree. So I love it because I was raised just surrounded by cedar and uh, let's do it. All right, this is from, I published it in Al Jazeera during the pandemic too. I've been busy during the pandemic. I think that's the only way I've been able to just deal with all of this. So, all right, from a cedar tree. I'm one of the medicines of the Vunkatma people, of the people li living on Seabird Island band. Some old heads put a little bit of me in their shoes or make a little tea with me once a day when there's a virus afoot for protection. And cynics say it's superstition, not science. I have no human form, though once we walk like people do. There, these are stories we hear less now. When the people harvest bark in the spring, they will do it six feet from one another, smiling to close the distance. 
They will make bracelets and weave crowns and headbands and capes to celebrate name giving and graduations and potlatch and all the good things coming to the first people, the people who offer before they take, who never forget the medicines, whose practices are called superstitions, sometimes by their own. Trees still walk just slower. Please tell them there's a science to it, I promise. There was a little girl this time last year learning with her auntie how to pick a bow. You have to put down tobacco and say thank you and pray before you take something from a tree. The girl smiled. She was embarrassed to be stumbling as she prayed, as she said thank you to me. And I wanted to say thank you for carrying on this tradition of well-being of collecting medicine for your auntie who will put the bow above her door to keep spirits away. The auntie does not know if this tradition is Unkatma or Christian, given what white people did to her, to her culture, to her soul. She does not care because it is what her grandmother taught her to do and it is Unkatma now. These are matriarch hands on me, generations of power, of offering, of celebration, of pain, of burial. A burial is called a, called a planting where we are. This auntie, her mother, was planted in a cedar box carved by one of the men on Seabird who would not take any money. My fear, when I saw the beauty of the box, was that it would someday be uncovered by an anthropologist who would find the mother's bones remarkable, the box remarkable, and then nobody would rest. It would all be in some exhibit in Chicago or New York, but today she rests. I am asleep now too. I cannot say in my waking hours I am more lively than I am now. There is spirit in quietude, in receiving and watching. Stillness and observation can inspire. The diamondback rattler, the moment she was still, before she turned a corner, inspired a girl in her weaving to make the first diamond pattern in a bas basket. We regale each other and fit together in simple ways. This interconnectedness has worked for a long time now. Forgive me if I am too relational to the people I have known for thousands of years. I could tell you about cherry bark or canary grass, how we mingle in baskets to bring water, or I could describe my being verdant and rusted in the dull reaches of myself how you cannot run your fingers against the grain of my outer bark or bough. It hurts too much. Elders say some things are worth hurting for, others are not. Common sense is taught doing practical things like harvesting my roots for different kinds of baskets, different kinds of legacies. I hope will not, will not, I hope will one day not be museum exhibits, but home decor where kids ask, what's that auntie? And someone says, your lifeblood, your whole culture is above the fireplace. Do you want to go outside and say thank you? And that's, um, that's from a cedar bath. All right. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I wish I could clap louder. I love, love, love you, Therese, and your writing is, um, there's so much that strikes me uh, about, about your writing, about your work, and there already um, are lots of questions coming in uh, in the question box, and I 
think that I already planned to speak to um, a number of those questions and Emily is going to be managing some of it. Um, yeah, lots of people. I love you too, <laughs> Oh, that's a love fest. Yeah, uh, Therese and I, um, we we laugh a lot because we're like minus six degrees of separation in Indian country and particularly in our writer circle. <laughs> you can't help but know everybody. I feel like every native, like you talk for 10 minutes and you know somebody, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. And you find out, find out about all of the mutual connections. And yeah. we that's have a you lot. That's to act right. That's what it exactly it keeps you keeps you honest holds you accountable <laughs> well Teresa and i both share that we're we're alums of the beautiful and magnanimous uh ever complicated institute of american indian arts Therese graduated from the mfa program and i graduated uh before the mfa program had actually been established and we're um we don't we don't rest on our laurels too much. We know that our BFA and our cohort that graduated because there was so much success um, in that era that we went on to like Cornell and Brown and some of the best MFA programs in the country. And so it's just so special to be part of that legacy. And shout out to any other alums if there are any any other IA alums, <laughs> put it in the put it in the chat box. Um, and I just wanted to do a couple of shout outs before um, I, I get into the questions. Um, tomorrow, we're actually doing a youth writing workshop. And um, I do, um, as Emily mentioned, manage the Native Education Program for Highline Public Schools. Shout out Highline if anybody is, is on from the district um, or surrounding districts. We have so many amazing Native students in our program. And so um, we actually are opening it up. Whoop, whoop, I, I got to close the chat box. I'm going to get all distracted. <laughs> Um, but uh, we are doing a workshop at 4.30 tomorrow um, via Zoom. So if you'd like to join us, um, please just shoot me an email. I'm going to go ahead and pop my email into the chat box at the end. Um, but it's open to high school and college age um, and and, their, and families also. So uh, Therese has some really, really special um, prompts and, and activities planned for that workshop. So please join us if you are able. Um, and encourage youth in um, in your in your midst to participate with us. And then the Northwest Native Writer Circle, you can find us on Facebook. We're a ragtag grassroots collective of native writers, natives who just like to write, like to talk about writing, like to support others in um, creating new work and getting publishing opportunities. Um, we host learning opportunities like this. Um, we're really grateful to Hugo House for supporting um, a lot of our work when we just first got established. And we like to support Native youth to see themselves as writers and to um, really just lift voices. Um, our Native people are so, so beautiful and so dynamic and creating all the time and the more platforms we have the more um, points of access the more resources we have um, that's how we grow stronger so support our work Northwest Native um, Writer Circle and find us on Facebook and um, I am going to go ahead and uh, just just get into it um, your work is um, equal parts excavation and resurrection. There's so much going on in, in your work. It's a tome of sorts and so, so much prayer song, so much of your voice is, um, it really does feel like a, um, like like it's being lifted up by the ancestors <laughs> and and like a, the, like you're a conduit in many ways for so many other voices, but not being wholly representative. I like that you brought that forward on Trevor Noah um, that you know it's we often get um, sort of painted into a corner sometimes. I've heard it referred to as a Sherman Alexi effect. Like when you read one native author, you read them all. And so then people end up not doing the work, right? And doing the, the cultivations to actually discover all sorts of new native writers and other native writers. Um, but um, I'm just wondering, um, especially in this time, it's so insane in a pandemic, you're a mom, you're a writer, you're, you're a professor, you're doing all, all the things and you um, do so much in the book that I think speaks to this time also, which is, is, is uh, strangely cathartic and feels like preparation. I remember sitting with your book a couple of years ago and it felt, um, 
very much in time and like it was um it was exactly what i needed to to read and experience at the time and i think it's 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 going to stand the test of time and help people a lot to get through these wild <laughs> times but what are what are your thoughts on um the writer's moral obligation to speak to the chaos to speak to uh racism and the fear that's kind of in ourselves at this point um and do we have an obligation as writers to speak to those things or or not? <laughs> I don't know, because, you know, I think it's definitely, I think for me, when I was writing my book, it was a lot about survival, right? Like, yeah. I was writing the things that wouldn't let me go. But I think g moving through the things that wouldn't let me go felt like a moral obligation like the things that wouldn't let me go were my relationship to stigma and stereotype and the fact that I felt like a living one you know I felt like as a young mother as a person who had a lot of dysfunction in her family I felt like um, those things were haunting me and if I couldn't make sense of them then I would have um, died unnamed, you know, like my experience would be unnamed. So I felt an obligation to that and to my spirit as a human being. But now that I have, you know, I think, I don't know if overcome is the right word, but now that I've moved past that personal, you know, journey, I feel an obligation to be good to people, not only in my work and be honest, because sometimes being good doesn't mean being nice, you know, okay. and to be honest. And, um, and I think through that, I found a good calling, you know, but really what I do morally is through mentorship. So like, I know that because of my lineage, because of the good women in my life, I have to do right and create more opportunities and not, you know, fall into the trap of like ego and not try to um, take up too much space, space as a, you know, First Nations woman, you know, not to take up too much space and to also um, make sure people know about other writers who like you know, Arielle Twist, who's an indigenous, you know, trans woman, but she's also a kick-ass poet, like, always thinking of how, how else I can help others and how else I can share, because it's really lonely when you just want things for yourself and you're out there doing the writing life, unless you bring other people in, you know, so I think that's my moral obligation, learning as a teacher, because language changes all the time. So like, you know, I last year for me, learning about ableism and trying to be decent in that sense was a first. I never knew about any of that stuff. But as a professor, I think we have an obligation to sh reshape our language almost every year. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, that opportunity, it causes anxiety and also excitement. <laughs> but yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that about accessibility because we have Zoom, the Zoomification of the world. Um, yeah. Everybody's doing all the teaching online, but closed captions and things like that to support to support everybody. It's, um, yeah, that's it's needed. It's necessary. I wanted to ask you, um, there's so much that you you put forward in the book, you're so vulnerable, you're so, so raw and, and honest um, with so much of it. There's both a starkness and a richness and the lyricism of your work is next level. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I'm sure it's, it's something to think about what's, what's next, but um, what are you, what are you still, what, what are you still working on in terms of what you, you may not be ready to write? Is there anything that you're still, that you're afraid to write or that you're just not ready? Well, I'm on contract to finish a book by January 15th and I don't know if I'm going to do it, <laughs> but like, it's a, it's a book about a young, um, you know, bookish, weird, indigenous girl growing up on from where i'm from so from seabird island 
And uh, it's really closely based to my life, but I had to write all of that autobiographical stuff so that this character could really actually live apart from me. So, like, I'm writing that, and for me, it feels, like, really touchy because it's dealing with the fact that growing up on Seabird, you're right by that highway in British Columbia, and, you know, and you're also seeing all of these systemic issues at play that are you know, statistics, but they're real life for you and your, and your people, you know? So writing about those issues almost feels like it scares me to write about those issues in a responsible way, but I know I have to do it. Um, and I can't sensationalize those issues, but I have to make them real. And I think that's so hard to do. It's so hard to make our realities hard to digest and complicated in art. You know, it's hard to do that on the page, even though it's like hearing the music in your head, but you can't play it yet, you know? Yeah. So I'm trying to figure it out, but, you know, I just don't, I think it's so important to hold up the truth of the story, but also, you know, don't let myself be exploited. And it's really easy to get exploited by accident in this yeah. business, yeah. you know, cause you might be having a great conversation with a non-native person and then they just kind of swing into a question that's just over a boundary. And it's like, your auntie's not there to tell you to tell them to stuff it. You know, they're not there to guide you and do, it's all up to you. And it's like, you know, sometimes it's hard, you know. Yeah, to always show up with your big girl pants on and, and yeah. advocate for yourself and all the spaces the literary world is cutthroat and, yeah, and not straightforward. Yeah, and for you. Yeah, because the next okay. person, you know, benefits from you speaking up. That's why I think we all, if you feel like you need to be a necessary disruptor in this life, do it, you know, and know that someone like me will have your back. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Because we need those aunties, like, even like like literally in the space, but also just knowing that we have people in the circle who have our back and are going to be relentless with it. Um, I wanted to ask you, and it's sort of touching on a question that, that I saw come up. Um, how do you balance the, the public and the private um, aspects in your work? How do you um, save some for you also? That was one thing that came to mind was like, how do you um, do the excavation, um, do the work of really pulling from the deepest parts and going, really going there with your, with your stories, um, but also not go insane and maintain some balance? <laughs> well, I think that's the the only thing is like protecting your emotional sensibilities. So if you feel like you've given somebody too much, you probably have. So like, but I've yeah. done that so many times in the past that I felt conditioned for public life, you know, you know, cause when you talk to a social worker or something, when I was a, a teen, they want you to be contrived. They want you to be pitiful. They want you to beg for services. Like, they don't, they don't really see you as a human being. So like, honestly, all that work I did being interviewed by, you know, youth outreach workers and social workers prepared me for oh, yeah. book touring yeah. because yeah. like they ask <laughs> probing questions like a social worker. They're like, so how are you doing now? Like, how is your, you know, it's like, you feel like you're being evaluated. <laughs> so like, I've just come to realize like, I just want to be real, you know, and if I feel like they're overstepping a boundary, mostly I smile and like deviate. But for me, I always think about the person in the audience that like, if I'm feeling like I need to talk about med management, you know, I need to say, hey, like, my success is like, owed to, you know, my people, my family, and like my children, but it's also owed to therapy and med management. Mm -hmm. Like saying that, if I feel like the space needs to hear that, I'll say it. And I think I'm in also in a position where if that makes me vulnerable, I can defend myself. You know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for lifting that up too, because as a people, not just 
in America, Canada, but all across the globe, like we're um, in a mental health crisis. So like we talk about the public health crisis that is the pandemic, but pre-pandemic, um, our people have been hurting like and not, and not being able to be honest about, um, you know, mental health challenges. And at this point it's in our children, it's in our youth, it's in our elders, it's in all of us. And to be so brutally honest and vulnerable in that journey that you've been on, um, I think is power. I think it's, it's medicine in a lot of ways to to the people. Um, I wanted to ask you, and this is touching a little bit on that on that other question. We talked a little bit about this. Um, you know, writing um, writing truth and sharing stories, quote unquote, secrets or private traumas, but some of those things that are at the heart of the matter that aren't that aren't yours. It's like the, the collective. You spoke about your brothers um, figuring in, in the work and of course your dad and your mom and Casey and your and your children. Um, a lot of writers want to know how do you how do you navigate that um, and not share too much or what's the process and protocol around like, hey, is this okay <laughs> to share? I don't know. I always thought if I'm harder on myself, I'll get into less trouble. So like, you know, if I'm writing about a relationship where I, you know, I'm with somebody who might be gaslighting me or not treating me right. Like if I'm honest about my own dysfunctions and self-effacing, and I also, thanks to this advice from Tony Jensen, if I give the character and like the person I'm writing about one trait they want to see in themselves whether that's like you know oh he's so tall he's so large he's so you know beautiful as a man if i write that they're less likely to have a problem with them in the book you know right. so, <laughs> it's about doing that too you know you have to be self-effacing first and if you do that usually they like how you render down the truth of the relationship or the truth of motherhood um, and also i reveal more about myself than i do about any of my subjects you know like because i think that's just like paying a toll to like enter that space and be honest about a relationship is you have to you know withhold things that you know they don't want out there and talk to them if you want a relationship after the book, talk to them about like, hey, could you read this this text and could you talk to me about it? Um, because when I did that with my brothers, when I did that with my husband, it was they were tough conversations, but ultimately they they supported me and that that's why I moved forward. Like my father, I don't owe him anything, you know? So like writing about how he hurt me, that was just the truth that needed to be told. And it was my experience. So, you know, even if he was alive, yeah, I would have done it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that um, that's a that's a very personal, personal experience for sure. The relationship between fathers and daughters, particularly mm -hmm. native fathers and daughters, and especially mm -hmm. when there's trauma. Um, Plus, and then it changes the relationships. You Keep know? writing. Like, yeah. yeah, sometimes your voice is necessary to to move into the next phase of that life, you know. Um, and sometimes it doesn't need to be published. It just needs to be read by that other person. You know? Right. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, I think we have just a couple minutes left and then we're going to shift over to the questions from the audience. Um, but um, definitely wanted to ask you, and this is a two part question and they are connected and aren't connected, but in, in Therese Myatt's view, what is the future? What's the next level of, of native literature, um, native writing and writers? How do we get there? What are some pro tips and uh, what are you hopeful about? Um, and then also what are you reading? Okay, I'm reading Kelly Jo Ford's uh, Crooked Hallelujah. I'm reading that right now. Um, I was like, you know, there's other things on my list. Um, but the future, I want it to be like, we have the right to write um, romance novels. <laughs> or we have the right to make some really average art and still make a lot of money and have success and you know we have the right to make a cheesy rom-com you know what i mean we have the right to uh 
and we also have the right to be experimental. Like in the future, I see just more, you know, like yeah. more of it. I want more. I want, I want to see, you know, if somebody, especially young Native women, when they come to my readings and they're like, you know, do you think I could do this? Like the answer is always yes. Like I can see you, like I can see you on TV. I can see you. If you want a bestseller, I can see it, you know? And it's like, I want people to feel that, you know, because it's like, we're discouraged so much in our life. And I just, I don't have time for that, you know? And I mean, yeah, just see, see more, you know? And whatever you want to do, don't feel burdened by what's come before like you're setting your own pathway and like mm-hmm. that's real it's not you know think grand thoughts about yourself you know absolutely yeah i love that just the yeah. abundance we want to see all the all wild beautiful <laughs> things all the all the experimentation lots of experimentation has to go on to <laughs> get to a, a wider array um yeah, I really, really love that. And I'm just so grateful to you for your work and anything that I can do to to support you. I'm just so, so glad to be in the same circle as you and um, everybody out there. If you haven't read Heartberries, definitely buy it. I saw that the link that's at the bottom of the screen isn't working, but um, yeah, shout out to Third Place Books. You can definitely find your way to, to purchase the book. Heartberries is... Um, it's, it's it's a transformational work. It really, really is. There's a reason that audiences have responded to it in the way that it is. It changes you and it lives in you once you experience it and you're you're open to it. So thank I live you. in you. You live in you live in us now. <laughs> thank you, Therese. Well, thanks to both of you. That was a lovely conversation. I did just put the link to third place to get the book again if you want to buy it. Sorry about the broken link there. We have lots of questions, um, so I'm just going to get right to them. This one's from uh, Lauren. Your writing is so poetic. Does that come naturally to you, or have you studied lots of poetry? I do read a lot of poetry. Um, like, I'm reading Emily Dickinson now. Um, her, like, nature poems, like Mayflower and things like that. And I think, you know, Mayflower, it starts, like, soft pink and punctual or something like that that's the first description of a mayflower and i'm like you know there's so much in those just three little lines and it's like so when i'm writing i think like how do i how do i like hold back and give the reader their words they need not the words i want to purge or not like flexing and showing that i'm a good writer they i want them to trust me you know what I mean? So I think about poetry as like, it's expedient and it's true and it's image driven. And I feel like those are really good, like methodologies. Those are really good practices for writing. Um, that said, it, you know, I think I'm like, I, I'm i not a poet, so I should not write poetry. <laughs> but, you know, essay is good, you know. <laughs> Uh, So speaking of essays, Lisa said, what makes a really good essay and whose writing do you enjoy reading? That's hard. Um, Like, I really enjoy reading. um, Let's see. I really enjoy reading James Baldwin, like enjoyment in terms of like knowing that that's quality work and that it's like resonant and emotional, but it's also succinct and intellectually like stimulating. So like, it gives me all types of enjoyment. I like um, Alice Walker, Um, you know, I think she has that blue essay about a horse, right? And it's, I think it's like a thousand words or something and it just really examines what it's like to live close to like a horse who has no partner. And you see like the inhumanity of people to how they sometimes own horses and don't think about a horse's emotional like intelligence or spirit. And um, it really sticks with me. And Woven by Lydia Yuknovich is like one of my all time favorite essays because it's a weave and she like, she does braids 
to this degree of like excellence where like you see the structure and it's also messy so it's not a perfect braid you know but it's like natural and fresh you know um I can name a lot of writers. Uh, Stephen Graham Jones's letter to a young Native writer is like, it makes me feel good. Like it makes me feel like a good, like I can do something, you know? Um, yeah, I can name a bunch, but those are just like things that off the top of my head I'm thinking about. Tony Jensen's Carrie, I just, I blurred that. So yeah it was really good if you want to see my thoughts on it look in the back of her book i think it's <laughs> yeah i'm taking notes uh so we'll send out a list we have the email addresses for everybody to register yeah. we'll create a list and send it out to everybody so people can track these down too uh let's see Uh, so this is a question from Therese Lamb. She says, I love the book from beginning to end. It made me think of my own experiences growing up and all the nooks and crannies of the good shit and the bad shit and how it blended and became the fabric of life. That's what I loved about your storytelling. Question, in what ways has Heartbreaks changed you now that you're out, you've finished the book? Um, did the end of the book reveal anything to yourself that wasn't there before? Yeah, the book, so I started it as a letter to my partner because he had all of these ideas about mental health and women like he was he like would say that I was crazy and like you know I would have felt like that's unfair like you know it's there's a backstory and there's also the dynamism of like how I've come to be complicated and faulty but human you know and so I thought about that because it was a commentary that a lot of men say to women sometimes, like she's crazy, right? And I was like, well, I wanna humanize myself, you know? And um, so for me, that's like an objective and it's a pure one that I kind of roped into. And it did change me because writing about that made me feel like I was trying to redeem myself. And then when I just let go and I was like, don't try to redeem yourself. Just try to tell the truth of your life and see what humanity you render, what person comes out. And um, whoever loves you after that is a good person. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Um, so I did that. And then I realized I wasn't writing to appeal to a man to love me. I was writing to, like, make sense of my life. And I thought if I could make it sense to of my life to the external world it would make sense to me so by the end of it i realized it's not even about a man it's about overcoming my shit and growing and like being proud of who i am you know and you get that sensibility by the end of the book that it's like yeah my life is it has a lot of trauma, but it's like, I'm, I'm proud of who I am. I'm proud of where I come from. And I, and I love my mother. Like those sentiments are just really strong at the end. And I didn't know it was going to end up that way for real. Like I didn't. This is a question from um, Alicia or Alicia. She says, I remember being struck by something I heard Toni Morrison say, most books are written even by a um, BIPOC audience are written or by BIPOC writers are written for a white audience. And Toni Morrison had decided to opt out of that. There's merit to writing to a white audience, but also to your own community audience. Who do you feel is the audience you need to write to? I don't know, because the thing is, I'm, I am writing for my people, but I know I made them mad at some of the things. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, my, my bad, like, but that needed to be said. Like, you know, cause I was in writing about my friend, right? Or writing about my own life. Like I'm not just outing myself, but everybody related to my father. You know what I mean? So those truths might not have been ready to be out for a dozen or more people, you know, but for me it was time. So like handling the fact that I might've done that, like, it, it does weigh on me, but it's also like, it felt like a necessity. And I, I do feel like it has liberated other people to feel like they can speak out against people who've hurt them. Um, 
So I kind of do picture my people, but I also picture them, you know, shaking their fist at me too while I'm writing. And I'm like, good, you know, as I'm just typing. <laughs> but it has to be like, I, I don't always do it right, you know, and I think accountability is really important as a writer. So like knowing what you want to upset in a person and, you know, I don't write for a white audience, but that said, it's like, I don't really think about them like actively. I don't think, oh, I'm writing about like sweat lodge, like, you know, do I need to explain what the hell that is to a white person? I think if they really care about reading native writers, they can use Google, you know, and they'll be okay. Cause we use Google when we read English literature. And, you know, when I learned what a chaise lounge was, I had to Google it. That's some white stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, so we have hit time. I just want to say thanks so much to both of you for being with us tonight. As a reminder, you can purchase Heartberries from Third Place Books, and I will drop that link in the chat one more time here. Uh, and thank you to you, Emily, and everybody at King County Library System. We love our librarians. I popped my email into the chat box. So if anybody has any um, questions about the way we're approaching um, exposing our students to more Native writers in Highline Public Schools, I love those questions. And we actually have a book list uh, that's been vetted. We work with American Indian Children's Literature um, to make sure that we uh, get good, good materials into the hands of our students. So um, yeah, love you librarians and love you at KCLS. Well, thanks again to both of you. Thank you. Everyone for being here. Have a good night.